Okay, we're back. We're live. It's 3 p.m. on a given Wednesday. Make that Thursday. Uh, orientation is time and space. It is Thursday. I'm Jay Fidel, and uh, this is Energy in America. We're studying energy in America every two weeks at this time, often with uh, Lou Pugliarisi, but today it's with Pat Ogerell, and he is a uh, research analyst uh, for uh, EPRINC, APRINC, which is the Energy Policy Research uh, Organization in Washington that looks into all kinds of um, macro and international issues around energy, and that's where Pat is from. Uh, so, so Pat, um, it's very interesting. The topic we we uh, chose today, which I, I suspect you chose today, <laughs> is what Who stands in the way. <laughs> okay, right. What stands in the way of our transition? And I and I take it when you say transition, you mean a transition to renewables and to clean energy and you know um, you know greenhouse, no greenhouse gases or carbon and so forth. Everybody has this on their minds. I mean, Hawaii, we've been thinking about this for 15 years and articulating policy about it. But, you know, things get in the way. And uh, this, this show, this discussion will be about, you know, the, what the global obstacles that we are experiencing and will experience in terms of transitioning to renewables and clean energy. So you have identified a few. Let's go through them. What is your favorite one? <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much, first of all, uh, in, for inviting me to, to your show. Um, so today's topic is very interesting, especially you know, given um, all this hype um, around renewables and also recent announcement, announcements by governments, um, including the uh, Biden administration on net zero targets and then their infrastructure, renewable and infrastructure plans um, that goes out to, to mid-century 2050, 2060. So it's gonna be a very uh, interesting to see how we can achieve those energy, you know, um, clean energy goals. Yeah, um, let, me, let me ask you about the $2 trillion Biden plan that's just been rolling out, rolled out now. Yeah. And uh, the, the details are in the newspapers, of course. But I have one question, maybe you can help me with it. Uh, how much of the $2 trillion is energy? So I think the uh, entire, I think that the, the entire $2 trillion bill is in one way or another related to energy. And uh, from the news articles, I am receiving, you know, receiving six hundred um, billion are for transportation, but not all of that is uh, related to energy. Um, of the six hundred billion dollars for transportation, one seventy billion, one hundred and seventy billion. Uh, is for um, EVs, EV electric vehicle uh, financing projects. So I don't know the um, the whole picture or the detailed numbers, but um, but it's uh, you know all aspects of the bill is in one way or another related to um, uh, President Biden's um, clean energy uh, goals. Yeah, you know, maybe you can help me with my eyesight also. I, I, I have a very strong recollection that this bill, which has been discussed by the Biden administration for the past couple of weeks anyway, or longer, um, what was a $3 trillion bill. Now, look again, bingo, and it's a $2 trillion bill. What, what happened to a trillion there? Um, to be extremely honest with you, I didn't have an answer to that. So <laughs> Lou might be the better person, but yeah. Um, yeah. I'm right though. It 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 came down a trillion dollars in the past few days. Am I right? So it's yeah. It's I, I agree. It's it's very hard to you know um, to achieve or, or implement you know the uh, previously announced goals or stated policies. It's, yeah. it's just when it comes to real politics, it's just difficult. And then that's something I I would um, talk about um, later. Sure today so um 
Why you, know, you know what Everett Dirksen used to say? He was a senator years ago. He used to say, <clears throat> a trillion here, a trillion there. After a while, it adds up to real money. <laughs> okay. So yeah. Um. So I have a few slides today. Um. Can I uh, see the first slide? Um. So wanted to. I wanted first wanted to show you and in the audience, um, what the energy current energy system is, and then the current energy mix is, to you know illustrate where we are now. Um, so th this graph, this Sankey diagram shows um, the current world energy system. On the left-hand side is uh, primary energy supply by fuel type. And then on the left, uh, on the right-hand side is um, final end use uh, by sector. And then if you look at the energy, the left-hand side, uh, it's clear that the world energy system is extremely, you know, very, very dependent on fossil fuels, which accounts for about 90% of the global um, primary energy supply or demand. And, um, and then the uh, blue box in the middle is electricity. And I can, I'll talk about that later in the show, but, um, it's uh, about it's less than half of the uh, less than half of the primary primary energy supply goes to electricity, meaning that there's a lot of you know, a lot of room to grow electricity in the future. Power and you know electricity, uh, sorry, heat and electricity, which both of which uh, constitute uh, the power sector. And then um, on the <laughs> right. So this yeah. uh, this chart is very interesting. It's, it's not a dynamic chart. It's no, it's no, no time feature here. It's, a, it's yeah. right now today. It's yeah. It's it, for it shows you where the energy is coming from and where it's going. Right? Yeah, it's 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 the current. It's it's from 2019, and then mm -hmm. you will see in the chart that um, buildings, transportation, and industry are the three you know important sectors that. Uh, use um, energy evenly. So, um, so just yeah. So if you go to the next chart, which shows um, the U U.S. energy consumption, and it is compared to the rest of the world, more reliant on natural gas and oil, and um, you know still fossil fuels. So uh, it's gonna be you know, a difficult challenge for not just the world, but also for the US to decarbonize its economy because the current technologies um, don't allow a lot of, um, you know, uh, decarbonization uh, technologies, you know, carbon capture, sequestration and hydrogen, they are not um, on the table yet. Mm -hmm. So, so if I look uh, at this chart, I, I see a big uh, green swatch there. Is, is that oil? What is that? That's green? oil. Yeah. And then uh, also, uh, yeah. Uh, go, go ahead. ahead. Identify, identify yeah. what the sources are. So uh, the green uh, yeah, line is oil. Um, and it goes, most of it goes to transportation. And then, you know, within the three, uh, among the three sec main sectors, although they use um, similar amounts of energy, their sources are very different. For example, buildings in the US consumes a lot of electricity, uh, whereas um, industry uses a lot of natural gas, uh, but the US economy is not manufacturing based. So it's you know, it's, it's, you know, comparatively smaller than the other two, but for China, it's bigger. And then the coal consumption that goes into industry is way, you know, much larger than, than that. So, um, and, and if you look at transport, um, you know, although there are a lot of talks about electric vehicles and um, net zero uh, transportation, electricity, it, you know, accounts for only a small, very tiny portion of um, 
the transport sector. So, um, so, so where, where is where is renewables on that chart? Um, if you go back to the chart, um, the renewables are um, the first one is hydro, nuclear, and then the third one is the renewables. Mm -hmm. And then if you just compare the uh, width of the lines um, of the first three, they are they are much smaller than the um, than natural gas, oil, and mm -hmm. biomass, um, and uh, coal. Yeah, this is actually uh, at first when you showed this to me, I I thought it was the New York City subway map, um, but it's much more interesting than that. As a matter of fact, can we go back to the first one? The first yeah. one was global, right? The first one is global. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a look at that compared. So there's plenty of oil there, and then uh, coal is huge. Um, mm, that's the gray one. Of, that's the gray one. Yeah, the gray one. Half of which comes from China, because China's economy is extremely dependent on coal, 60, um, 60 percent of its uh, energy demand comes from coal and its power sector is extremely dependent on coal. So, um, and then other, you know, energy fuels are important and then renewables, hydro, new, renewables are growing solar and wind, but they, you know, the, the scale of that pales in, in comparison to the other more traditional energy sources. So this looks fairly complex. It also, well, maybe it's just the way the chart is set up, but uh, it, it suggests that to move these things around, to change them is really complex too. It's a chore to change yeah. those pieces. And so I get, I get a couple of things here out of your comments so far. Number one is, correct me if I'm wrong, but you need to have government support the change. In other words, the, these these lines mm -hmm. on the transition to clean energy, they don't. It's not really a matter of the utilities or the public so much as it is the government showing the way, establishing policy and programs, but also writing checks for tax credits or supports of one kind or another. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you had the government do little or nothing. To support the transition, that would that would be a problem, and the yeah. transition could not happen without government because these are always big projects, big numbers, you know, big human activity. That's one thing I get. the The other thing I get is, as I said, is that it's complex, and in order to change a chart like that, which is so complex, you a you need time, and b you need buy it by not only um, you know the government but by various sectors in the economy the u.s economy the global economy the economy you know, involving all the entrepreneurs all the investors all the management all the workers they all got to get together on the same page to make this change am i right about that that's absolutely correct yeah i agree with you um so first politics is extremely important um, political support because the other two challenges, main challenges are costs and technology. Some, you know, some, there, some um, technologies are readily available, but they are not cost effective against the incumbent, the current technologies, or, you know, it's hard for consumers to adopt those technologies. And second, you know, these most of the nascent technologies, or or you know, even for more mature, cost competitive renewables, it's hard to scale up because of their technological, you know, um, issues, intermittency. So technology and cost are the main issues. But without government support, it would be impossible to reach these goals, even with government support. It's it's yeah it's extremely difficult to reach these goals. But Let, let's talk about technology for a minute, Ben. You know, if we if we look back to um, inverters, for example, on solar installations back 15 years ago, they were primitive. Now they're not so primitive. You know, a lot of them are made in China. It's electronics, and as the you know electronic industry, I, IT grows, develops, gets more sophisticated, 
Manufacturing gets easier, cheaper. Design gets better. Um, we have better technology. However, it seems to me that, that you have to have an awful lot of people adopting the technology and you have to have integration of the technology. All those wires have to go somewhere. <laughs> you, can't, yeah. you, can't, you have to connect it up. And, and so uh, would you see, would you see um, obstacles, that's what we're studying today, uh, to the transition um, in some aspect of handling new technology, making it, um, making it to solve a problem instead of just theoretical for the sake of it kind of technology and connecting it up to, you know, all, all, the, all the other devices it must connect to. Is that an obstacle? So yeah, that's an obstacle. So let's uh, go over a list of technologies that need to be adopted at scale. Um, I was reading um, Bill Gates' new book uh, uh, titled How to Avoid uh, Climate uh, Disaster. And then he listed uh, technolo the technologies that need to be um, financed and then uh, scaled in order to reach the uh, you know, 2050, 2060 mid-century carbon neutral goals. And then those are, there are a lot of them, but there are more than a dozen uh, technolo technologies and fuel sources from, do you want me to list all of, you know, go through the list or? I can how many, how many I, before I answer that, I need to know how many are on the list. There, there, you know, I just, just to go, th you know, just to name a few hydrogen okay. without emissions. Okay. Hydrogen technology is important, but, you know, currently we use gray hydrogen um, that is from natural gas, but it's not, its emissions are not captured um, and sequestered, but CCUS or, or you know, ca carbon um, capture and uh, carbon capture utilization um, or sequestration technology is important for that. And, um, but there's another option, which is green hydrogen, which is also not co cost competitive at the moment. And then grid scale electricity storage. Um, there are a lot of talks about battery technology, lithium ion batteries, but um, you know, it's, uh, if you look at the EV price, um, it's still not cost competitive and then you're really dependent on subsidies and it's still a niche, niche market. Um, uh, to achieve grid, uh, grid scale electricity storage that is not only cost effective, but also is able to store you know, electricity for long periods of time. That's a huge task. Um, and some others are um, zero carbon cement and zero carbon steel. There are sectors that are, you know, rel relatively easier to abate, relatively, you know, um, you know, uh, cheaper. But there are sectors like industry, manufacturing, and especially cement and steel making that that are extremely um, energy intensive. Therefore, use um, uh, you know, uh, coal or natural gas, those sorts of fossil fuels. And um, it's hard to find an alternative to natural gas and coal and other fossil fuels for those harder to abate in uh, industries. And then, yeah, I can go through the list, but- um, well, I'll Hold there for a minute though. Yeah. Uh, you know, Bill Gates was uh, on 60 Minutes uh, maybe three, four weeks ago. Uh, and he was touting his book, as, as you mentioned. But he also uh, has invested, and it's speculative to some extent, um, a system to uh, infuse carbon that you don't want into concrete. So there's really a lot of concrete being made. You know, that's the, the metric of, of development, concrete. Mm -hmm. And when he's, he's developing a system where you can put the carbon, bury it, inert, into the concrete, get rid of it. Okay. And it's a very interesting idea. But what it raises is the other thing I wanted to mention to you is so a lot of this is experimental, really. Mm -hmm. And you know, Bill Gates is doing an experiment with, with the concrete 
carbon. And a lot of the a lot of the things we have out there, including the elements of electric cars, um, they're kind of experimental, except they're being practiced on hundreds of millions of people. Um, but 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 isn't that the only way we can get home? Isn't that the only way we can you know steer the course, to spend the money, even if it is not terribly economic, even if it is you know costs you more, but we learn. Because I don't think, I mean, if you agree, I don't think we can develop these sophisticated devices, systems, materials um, simply in, in the back end of a workshop. Mm -hmm. We have to let them breathe. We have to put yeah. them out there into the community, see what happens, see if they work. And they're never going to be economic to start with. We can yeah. only hope that at least some of them will become over time, economic. And that's the way you change society. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. Um, there are um, R&D projects supported by a, a DOE and then DOD um, in energy technologies. And then they, um, some of them have been extremely, very successful in the past. And uh, government direct support to those high risk, high reward technologies was you know uh, was the ma major driver uh, of their of these technology success. Um, I agree, but at the same time, it is also important to to you know to be able to see their limits and you know and and also understand that they have uh, they are not cost competitive and many of them will fail eventually. As we, as with, you know, as we've seen um, from the um, uh, so, so solar industry before, um, cheap Chinese um, solar panels were coming in. There were a lot of ebullience um, hype about solar, uh, about the solar industry, and then the U.S. solar industry was trying everything out um, from. PV to um, you know other I can't recall some of them right now, but they were in a different technologies. So um, none of almost all of them failed. So it, it's also I think important to to keep in mind that they are there are limitations to these. Yeah, no, well, that's that's how you learn, but uh, you can't you can't pour money into it past a certain point, it, it's no longer a workable experiment after a certain point. You know, I got something in the email, I'm going to bounce this off you, about the cost of a wind turbine. Because mm -hmm. the wind turbine involves a lot of steel, they're bigger all the time. Arguably, um, the bigger they are, the more efficient they are, but it's an awful lot of steel and all kinds of other materials. And it takes a, a tremendous amount of effort to manufacture it, and um, you know, integrate it and fabricate it and deliver it and, and install it. And, and this this article, I'm, I I really don't know. I don't have any sense of the credibility of the article, but it stood for the proposition that wind that wind turbines are simply not efficient uh, in terms of cost on the environment. That there's more carbon going in there, more work, more effort, more mm, blast furnaces, the steel steel factories and all that making this thing, then it will ever be in, begin to pay back to the to the environment. Um, and that it is, um, is it, this, the, this a modern wind turbine is never going to be efficient from an environmental point of view. Thoughts on that? Um, on that, I, um, yeah, I'll, please send me that article. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, you know, it's, uh, I'm not, 100% certain about that, but um, there are, you know, major drawbacks um, like siding and, uh, you know, well, you know, the wind turbines take up a lot of space and it's also harmful to local birds and, you know, etc. cetera. Um, what I was going to say is that, um, so yeah, I agree that. So I, I think I forgot what I was going to say. We're talking about the economics and we're talking 
and you have this list. Maybe there yeah. are other items on your list we can talk about in terms of obstacles to the transition. Yeah, I'll say, yeah, I'm sorry. I just, yeah, remember you to your point about steel that goes into wind turbine, making wind turbines. Um, the, you know, these new technologies, EVs and renewables, um, I'm not against them. You know, I'm a, I'm su I support renewables and um, clean energy, the clean energy transition. But at the same time, many of these technologies require a lot of steel um, and minerals, including rare earths, which is, um, you know, uh, which is controlled by a few countries, the sector of Earth, for example, uh, is uh, dominated by Chinese processors and also Chinese rare earth miners. So um, those will be uh, a challenge, you know, uh, uh, political and environmental stakeholders will increasingly realize that there are other challenges, um, including, uh, su including supply of minerals and rarities that go into these technologies. Yeah, and I, I, you mentioned an interesting point about China and uh, you know its control of rare earths and manufacturing processes that are, relatively speaking, economic. And that is the whole geopolitical thing. <clears throat> because you know, the whole energy technology adventure is really a global one and we need a lot of collaboration on that and if for reasons that are entirely political or geopolitical uh, we get into an argument with someone then maybe we cut off those minerals uh, rare, rare earths we cut we cut off the technology or the maintenance of, or elements components of the technology and all of a sudden where we thought we were being resilient we're not so resilient because there's a barrier created by, I call it a failed a geopolitical relationship. Um, so that's an obstacle, isn't it? That is, you know, for, from the environmental perspective, it probably is not an obstacle, or it might be because it, you know, cheap solar panels, for example, um, some, according to some studies, cheap solar panels from China hindered um, further growth in U.S. solar innovation. And, um, and also, uh, depending on um, a few countries on these minerals, for example, you know, uh, Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo controls cobalt, you know, important uh, component of, uh, you know, new energy, I'm uh, sorry, new energy vehicles or e electric vehicles. So those, and then the, the country is also known infamous for, uh, you know, some other issues, human rights and child, etc. cetera. So uh, it, along the, down the road, um, these will be an increasingly, uh, you know, uh, this will be a, you know, a big challenge, but I think uh, Europe, the US, Japan, and other developed countries are more aware of the situation now, and then they are trying to circumvent this challenge by um, developing domestic industries for cooperating with other industry, other countries trying to less reduce their dependence on, um, on, on these countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. So you had some more, you had some more charts. I know there are a couple more charts. Yeah. You want, so, you want to talk about them? Ben? Yeah, let's do that. Um, can I? Yeah. So this is um, related to uh, my earlier point about how hard it is to you know, uh, reduce reliance on uh, fossil fuels because you, you know this is a historical chart showing uh, energy consumption of the last fifty years, and um, the share of renewables and other alternative technologies uh, 
has grown. Nuclear, for example, has grown, but uh, but fossil fuel, the absolute values of fossil fuels have never gone down. There was never real energy transition in that period. So, so energy, the idea behind energy transition is a switch away from fossil fuels to other net you know, zero carbon technologies that will replace the former. But, um, but based on the historical past experience, it's proven to be extremely difficult with all the incentives and policies that have been implemented you know, in the past. So, um, and I can go to my next slide, which is not related to this one, but um, this is a, a chart. So this is from a Princeton University study showing what needs to be done for the US only to um, achieve net zero uh, emissions by 2050. And um, can, you, can you summarize this for us? I may not be able to read the words. Okay, so, um, so it's, just, uh, it's <laughs> just to repeat my point, it's a huge challenge. You know, for the first point is that EVs need to increase to 200 million. Um, by 2050, for example, and then there are other, you know, challenges or solutions, um, including ca carbon capture storage, clean electricity, battery technologies, zero, zero carbon fuels like bioenergy and bioenergy with uh, carbon capture uh, sequestration, which um, uses bioenergy to uh, capture carbon, um, you know, bioenergy, and then it captures carbon, and then the captured carbon is sequestered. It's a combination of two, two approaches. Um, so uh, it's gonna be uh, for the next two, three decades, uh, we have to do a lot to invest a lot of money and also, um, do a lot of uh, reforms, political hard decisions to reach these goals if we ever, you know, reach it. So well, I mean, it's a really, you raise an interesting point right there, and that is that it requires political will. I mean, political money requires political will, and action yeah. requires political will. And it's not just, you know, it's just because we had a bad storm from climate change. Um, it means con consistently, relentlessly, um, you know, doing stuff that requires political will every day, every day. And we never lose sight of our of our goal and our ops and our you know, and 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 we do not let obstacles stop us. And I suggest to you that maybe we have learned over the past twenty years that the world's really not well equipped to do that. Not only the United States, which has its own issues about political will, we know, but the world in general. So, but we we're I think we're in trouble on this. Have you any thoughts on that? So uh, yeah, political will is very important, and uh, actually uh, we're seeing a lot of um, you know commitments, pledges from governments across the world, around the world to achieve net zero in the next, within the next 30 to 40 years. Um, there are a couple of dozen countries that pledged to do so, including the US, um, recently Japan, Korea, even, and even China. So China last year pledged to, um, to achieve uh, net zero by 2060, not 2050. But these are long-term commitments and um, not a lot of, you know, they, not a lot of politicians will be in their current positions <laughs> in the next, by 2050 or 60. 
So, oh, um, so many things all, come up and distract us, you know? Yeah. So you can make a list of things that might distract us from relentlessly following the goal. And it's, so, it's an infinite yeah. list. So however aspirational or however moderated current uh, policymakers can be, it's hard to foresee the future. And then it's, uh, there will always be opposition and then also other factors that will prevent us from you know, reaching these goals. So yeah. one, thing, one thing you mentioned, I think it's worth talking about is the electric vehicle thing. Uh, I think you said 100 million, we need 100 million to really make a stab at it. Right now, Hawaii has something like 1300 electric vehicles on the road. And it's, it's going, it's, I wouldn't say it's going geometrically, it's not. It's mm -hmm. a straight line of, of increase and it's not all that fast. And people have been trying and talking about it for, you know, since electric vehicles were available. And I'm, and I'm thinking if that's the model that is prevalent in the country, where the uh, manufacturers, although somebody told me, uh, or I saw that General Motors said that by 2035, it doesn't intend to make any more, um, you know, uh, conventional cars. Um, that would be something. Um, but I think a lot, of, a lot of the automobile industry is not committed to electric vehicles because people don't necessarily want them um, because they already have the, the factories to make the conventional cars. They, they would have to spend an enormous amount of money to retool. Um, and so it's not moving as fast as it might be. Now, if you were president of that, or if I, or if the two of us, we had a you know, like partnership president, presidency, <clears throat> we would figure out ways to make this happen. But mm, I don't think that's happening all that quickly right now, not only in the US, but elsewhere. And so uh, I don't think we're going to reach 100 million right away. So that was 300 million, actually. Sorry, thank you. Just for the US. That's, that's, that's three times the number of doses or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> no, he, he said he was going to do 100 million doses in 100 days. Uh, um, let's see him do 300 million cars in four years. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that's uh, it's a, it's a big challenge, and it's you know we're talking about the U.S. right, and then there is I mentioned this earlier about Africa, um, South Latin America, and Southeast Asia. South Asia, they are gonna you know be growing. They their populations are gonna be growing. Energy consumption is growing. So those are the countries that we have to shift our focus to more because, you know, uh, consumers and policymakers in, in the U.S. and Europe are already pretty aware of the situation. And, but, you know, it's all, there, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty around how their policies will play out. But the real challenge will be in, in, in those less developed emerging economies. Let me ask you a, um, a Charles Dickens question. It's the ghost of Christmas future. Um, just suppose hypothetically um, that that last chart is what prevails, where, where we, we really don't have a transition. I mean, we are uh, sure we have some renewables, yeah, but we're still using oil and we're still using coal. Uh, and in these developing countries, which require additional supplies all the time to meet the demands of its population, which is, you know, burgeoning. Um, what happens if you have increased demand, but you don't have a change in the essential arithmetic for what the supply is? What happens to the country? What happens to people? What happens to the economy if that happens? So is it, can, you, can you repeat that question? Sorry. What so we, we really don't make a transition. Okay, if, yeah, okay. Last we, chart. We just, we just don't the, do it. The historical chart, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So what, happen, uh, what, happen, what happens? What, what does your economics tell you about that? Um, so for, for from the economic perspective, if we don't, I, if we don't, if we don't uh, meet the goals or Paris Agreement goals, economically, um, you know, it's, it's very hard <laughs> to, 
to tell. It's it's hard to predict that. So it's um, I will probably oh, okay. be well, able I'll, to answer that. In the, then I'll make it more complicated for you. Okay. Suppose <clears throat> same thing, but we start running out of oil and gas, or it becomes you know just marketplace more expensive. Okay. But these economies cannot afford it. So what happens is they cannot afford to get the energy they need or they should have to develop or even to remain, you know, remain viable. What happens then from an economic point of view, if they cannot afford the energy they need to grow or even maintain? Yeah, um, that, yeah that's a very good question. <laughs> that's a very good question. I, which I don't have answered to. Um, it's it will be difficult, and um, you know. Uh, do, but also that question um, reminds me of uh, peak oil demand. That was a big problem in the uh, you know a few decades ago when there were embargoes and then the you know conflicts in the Middle East, but the but the U.S. was uh, able to improve its technologies, and now it's uh, you know exporting oil and gas, and it has a lot of shale gas. So um, technological improvements will you know um, probably uh, you know keep us afloat. But I I don't. Think I have an answer to your hypothetical question, which uh, you know seems there's no. Um, well, we're not there yet, and yeah. probably the yeah. whole world can afford to spend some. Yeah, more but money. it's it's important to to think about those questions mm -hmm. earlier, you know, on the, rather than later. So yeah, we should all be alive when the crunch comes. Uh, so let me let me, let me ask you. We're almost out of time here. Only a couple of minutes. And I wanted to ask you what you would like to leave people with, you know, the conclusion that you reach and that you would urge them to reach about, about, about this whole problem of um, the reality of emerging obstacles, existing and emerging obstacles uh, to a transition to clean energy. What, what do you want to take away? So I, just to you know, reiterate my key points, um, Clean energy, the clean energy transition is good, good for the environment, and it's good for the health and well-being of the world and, and in the inhabitants of of, of the world. Um, but you know, reaching the Paris Agreement goals and net zero goals by these governments will be extremely hard, and then the main challenges would be cost technological technology uh, and and policy slash politics so those are the main um uh, uh, you know takeaways that i want the audience to get from this um show today so thank you Beth. and Beth ajarel from uh, eprink eprink in washington dc uh, an economic energy analyst thank you so much for joining us really appreciate your answering all my questions uh, and I hope that we see you again on the show in the near term. Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you so much. Thank you for Aloha. inviting. Aloha.